you know, there was a lot of great times, you know, there was a lot of connections, but it took a long time to break all those down, all those walls. Like for instance, when James actually, pretty much the way he recorded his vocals, he'd do one line, double it, move on to the next. You know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I go like, I go for performances. And um, he said, you know, he basically said, you know, I've never really sung before and, and not, you know, nothing else matters. And um, what's the other one? Unforgiven. Uh, Unforgiven, yeah. The yeah. two songs, you know, I've never really sung. I said, well, I'll do multiple takes and I'll comp it. And I said, I'll get, I said, what vocal sound do you like? And he said, I really like Chris Isaac's Wicked Game. And I said, mm. well, I'll get you that sound and then you won't have to double it. And therefore, you, you know, people are going to hear your voice in the emotion. And so we just worked on it. So I opened that door to him and, and he never went back. You know, those those are mm -hmm. the see, those are the things by making a whole pile of records um, because I'm so fucking old is that <laughs> I've, I've made a lot more records than them. So I just brought all the things I learned, you know, and just those doors open with all the they had only known the records they had done with um the other guys that mm. produced the records. You know what I mean? That's all they sure. knew. They never played in the studio together, ever, until the Black Album. Never. Well, it's interesting. There's a trust element, too. Like, even with my band, we had a song that just went gold called Judas. And when we originally started working with the producer, who also is a great lyricist, there's a little bit of adjustment. Like, I'm the singer of the band. I'm supposed to write the lyrics. And then you realize who gives a shit who writes the lyrics. All that matters is the song. And you have to learn to trust each other when you're working with somebody like our guys, Johnny Andrews or Bob Rock or Bob Ezrin or whoever it may be, Mutt Lang. And once you get that trust, then you're like, okay, dude, like, what do you got? And obviously you had that with Metallica because you did six, seven records together, but it just takes a little time to get to that place. Yeah. The trust is a big thing. And I had to earn it and really... To be quite honest, it was like they weren't Led Zeppelin to me. They were they were a heavy band, and I knew about them, but it wasn't like I was in the room with Jimmy Page or whatever, mm -hmm. or you know what I mean. So it was about making a record with them, and being around them, and what I've learned by I don't know being around great people like Mick Ronson when he, he produced the Palos album. Mm, wow. He taught me a lot. He he taught me a lot about perspective and stuff. And, you know, I just I just sat there and just, you know, it's a different perspective. A lot of people, maybe even yourself, you write a song and it's your perspective because you wrote it. But somebody that can come out maybe can see, well, this is great, but this could be better. And or you're not really doing enough of this type thing. Mm. That's an outside perspective, you know. So slowly I, I built that trust. Well, let's talk about when they did the load record, obviously. So it's five years later. How do you follow up such a massive record like the Black Album? And there was a style change and there was a, a fashion change. What was kind of your thoughts when they came in with this new idea of where they wanted to go? Were you behind, not behind it, were you all for it? Did you understand they had to go somewhere different? Because it is a, a, a real different sound for them. Well, we knew, you see, records like the Black Album you can't recreate it. You really can't. We could go in mm. the same building and it's not going to be the same. It's got a lot to do with the timing, where they are personally. I mean, I think the Black Album is probably James's most personal record. He wasn't in the same place. We cut like, I think it's 36 tracks. Took us like almost 10 months. And, you know, basically we were going to make a, a double record. And James had written maybe four lyrics and I realized this this was going to take probably five years to do, right? <laughs> right? So we decided to make two records. So we and I knew that they had just you know started their lives, wives, kids. I knew that it was going. I said, let's go to New York and just be alone. And that's how we finished the first half of Load. And it is a different sounding album. Like I said, it you can't you can't do the same thing. It's got the elements of yes, but uh, that are the same. But they just move on. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't go back. That would be like karaoke in a way. You know, all of a right. sudden there was, do you know what I mean? All of a sudden Leonard Skinner was a big thing. And some of their influences, 
when they discovered actually playing together, like Lode was the first time Kirk ever played rhythm guitar. He never played mm -hmm. any rhythms before that. Wow. Never. It was always just James tripled, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, so that was the first time he played rhythm guitar. That's a change in the sound. They were just not changing. They didn't want to change the same, but different is a great phrase from Bowie. Mm -hmm. It's the same, but different. It can't be the same. Yeah. Well, well, you go back to what you mentioned about Bowie. Like, for example, I mean, everything about Bowie was always different, but they still had anchors in the foundation of who Bowie was as an artist. Exactly. And, great, and all the greatest artists are like that. Yes. Everything, mm -hmm. everything, the, I think one of the things that I got with working, those guys have so much integrity. I couldn't believe their commitment and their integrity to who they were. I got them at a perfect time, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I learned tons from them. But at the end of the album, I never wanted to see them again. Absolutely. We felt feeling was mutual. We were in New York <laughs> after we mastered and, hey, it's been nice. Don't call. It was just like, <laughs> and I was serious. Randy Saab and I were just like, no way, never again. And unfortunately, it became huge. So what do you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly.